right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our St. Patrick's Day virtual tasting here at Alpha Omega Winery. My name is Barrett Spiegel. I'm the virtual ambassador here at Alpha Omega, and I'm going to act as your moderator for our virtual tasting today. I do have one request as moderator, and that is that you keep all of your microphones on mute throughout the duration of our tasting. We do want this to be interactive. We want to communicate with you all and uh, answer any questions that you might have. We will do that through our chat box here on the Zoom meeting window. Submit questions, comments, and I'm going to communicate with you all during our virtual tasting, and we'll do that through the chat box. First things first, if you're not wearing your green right now, you better go put it on because we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day today. So I'm, I'm going to check out all of you in the Zoom window here. If you don't have your green, you're going to get a virtual pinch from me or someone else that's with you is going to give you a pinch because we're going straight to Ireland to celebrate our heritage and St. Patrick's Day. We have three delicious wines from Alpha Omega to taste and discuss with you all. We have an incredible chef here on site that is going to prepare an amazing food demonstration to showcase for you all as well. And We've got an amazing performance, a couple of different performances that I think is going to take everyone here straight to Ireland. So let's have some fun today. Let's share some wines and enjoy this time that we have together. We have an amazing crew here at Alpha Omega joining us for this virtual tasting. Joining me here in our crush pad overlooking beautiful Rutherford Appalachian here in Napa, we have winemaker Henrik Polson. Master Sommelier Bob Bath, special guests, and very excited to have you guys here, our amazing vintners, Robin and Michelle Baggett. Cheers. Another special guest, very excited to have Chef Lars here from the Culinary Institute of America. Chef. Ooh, Ooh. Look at that. Neat. Look at that. Amazing. Look at that. Oh, very, very exciting. And also, you know, we've got we've got an amazing, uh, amazing group of dancers here that are going to are going to put together uh, that already put together an amazing performance. And our and our father, Donald, a special guest from Robin and Michelle joining us as well. Uh, we've got Michael from the Irish Dancing School joining us. Hello, my name is Michael Dillon. I'm a clearman and I'm here with my school of Irish dancing all the way from San Francisco. And I'm joined today by Father Donal, who's from County Cork, another Irish man. And we're so blessed to be gathered here today at, at the winery, celebrating St. Patrick. Aren't we the two luckiest Munster men alive to be here at Alpha Omega today? Absolutely, absolutely, and so are you blessed. Are you gonna tell us about St. Patrick and how we got to Ireland? Well, I can tell you a lot about St. Patrick, but isn't it incredible, it never ceases to amaze me that here we are, 1,500 years later, celebrating St. Patrick. Most Irish, all of us Irish men and women today, we never met him. But his life impacted every Irish man and woman. But no matter where we are throughout the world, when we gather together to in remembrance of St. Patrick, usually we have a drink in our hands. Well, you know, the right drink today, I'm hoping, you know. You, you but, are right. So, and do you know what we say when we drink in Ireland? The toast, we say, slante, salute. And it literally means, God be with you, good health, good wishes, the best. And then. Did you know that he was, that was actually his second time coming to Ireland. He was brought the first time as a slave from Wales by a man called Nile of the Nine Hostages, where he was put up to mind the pigs and the sheep. And then he escaped on a ship, went back to Wales, and God came to him in a dream and sent him back to Ireland with the shamrock. And did you know, green isn't the national colour of Ireland at all. What you know, is? It's St. Patrick's blue. So if you look at the crest of Ireland, it's got a harp on the, on the national crest, the only country to have a musical instrument on the front, which makes us also musical. But on the back, it's a blue background, not a green background. That's St. Patrick's blue. I never knew that. Very few people do. But if you go to Dublin Castle, which is our state apartments, you'll see all the carpets are blue. They're not green at all. 
So, well, I have learned something new today. But there's a very famous Irish blessing. St. Patrick used it. And it's what I would say to you all today as we celebrate St. Patrick. May the rose rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. Till we meet again, may God hold you all in the palm of his hand. And with Slaunter. That, Slaunter. And on that, we're going back to the studio for our first performance. Hey, I mean, in my past life, I believe I was from Ireland. So that this Irish dancing kind of gets me going. I love it. Very, very excited about our Irish dancers. And they're going to have another performance a little later in our virtual tasting. But if you've joined us for some of the virtual tastings that we've done in the last year, you a lot of you know that we love trivia here at Alpha Omega. And we also love when people decorate their virtual tasting setup or dress up in the proper attire related to what theme that we're going for today. So just to let you guys know, we've got two trivia questions today. Our vintner, Robin Baggett, is going to ask both of those. Let's try to keep this as cordial as possible. Type the answer on uh, in the chat box there. And the first person to answer correctly will be winning a Magnum big old bottle of our Oakville Single AVA, brand new wow. wine in collaboration with new That's consulting nice. winemaker Andy Erickson, a magnum of the 2018 Oakville wow. Cabernet Sauvignon. Boom. Henrik's, give, Henrik's giving me this look here <laughs> like, what? We're, we really want to give those out? Hey, that's what we're going to do. So first trivia question, Robin. You going to turn it over to me? Can I turn it over to you? You got it. I got it. And a magnum. You know, we... Uh, 750s are for amateurs. The magnums are for the professional drinkers. And so that's why we always give out a magnum. Now, I wanted to wear my cowboy hat today. So you know, all knew who I was. My wife wouldn't let me. So this is an Irish cowboy hat that I'm wearing today. <laughs> and <laughs> so anyway, our first trivia, and you notice the color. It's green. And in honor, uh, you know, our the people have been so fast and so good at doing this. I think we give a little honor to Alex Trebek, you know, our Jeopardy king of all time. And what the answer has to be in the form of a question. It'll make slow these guys down because they're too fast. <laughs> so in the form of a question, uh -oh. you've got to give the, the, the answer is, okay, so the answer is, why do we wear green on St. Patrick's Day? I don't know because apparently we should be wearing blue. I mean, I didn't. Know I didn't that. know that either. But <laughs> but knew? why do we? No, it's a, a little secret. So, so the, the, it, it has to be in the form of a question. In the form of a question, why do we wear green on St. Patrick's Day? Yeah. There you go. There we go. We we've got we've got answers coming in hot. We <laughs> we've got them coming in hot. We're gonna have our amazing uh, team here find the correct answer and then the winner for a magnum of 2018 Oakville single AVA Cabernet Sauvignon. That wine hasn't even been released yet. It gets released first week of May. So if you win, win that first trivia, we're gonna ship that out first week of May. Uh, so good luck, everybody. Well, Barrett, uh, I don't think, I haven't tasted of you. 
No. Just our winemaker. No. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah. I, laughs> Bob and Henrik have tasted it. <laughs> yeah, here we go. That's why Henrik looked at like, why are you doing that? Our you know CO I mean? is in the background, and I, he's blushing because he's tasted it before we have. <laughs> And you know that 18 vintage, Henrik will tell you that, and Bob, that it may be one of the best all time vintages in Napa Valley. So pretty special. Let yeah. Me, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll announce the winner of that first trivia when we, uh, when we find the winner of all these amazing answers here. Appreciate the, uh, uh, the participation here, but let's get started with our uh, tasting here. We've got three delicious wines. Very excited to uh, discuss these wines with uh, both our winemaker Henrik Polson and our master sommelier Bob Bath. And guys, we're starting with probably one of my favorite Chardonnays on planet Earth. This is a special single vineyard Chardonnay from Alpha Omega from the Drew Vineyard, the 2018 Drew Vineyard. I mean, Bob, does it get better as far as a vineyard than Drew? Well, you know, it's interesting, Barrett, because first of all, 100% of me is really excited today, but 25% is really, really excited because that's the Irish part of me in terms of this. But I'm really want to share with everybody kind of what Mount Veter is all about. I mean, when you talk about Mount Veter, uh, most of us don't think of Chardonnay. There's not a whole lot of, of Chardonnay uh, actually planted in Mount Veter, but uh, George Drew bought this vineyard in the late 1880s. And it is really a, a vineyard to me that is... Uh, shows that, that Chardonnay grows in the right places. And this is definitely the right place. It's a 20 acre vineyard planted to Cabernet Sauvignon and to Chardonnay. But the Chardonnay here to me is, is a very unique clone that we're gonna talk about with Henrik in just a moment. But more than anything, this is the kind of Chardonnay that, that perhaps you could even decant. And so often we talk about Cabernet Sauvignon need to be decanted for air. This is a Chardonnay to me that has great structure. When it has great structure like this, even throwing it in a decanter for an hour or so is really gonna make it show that much better. So it's got a long life ahead of it. Of course, from that 2018 vintage, but more than anything, this is a full body style of Chardonnay that really shows off the Wente clone. And when we don't talk about clones in, in Chardonnay so much, but this is a very historic clone and specifically one we call the Spring Mountain clone, a little bit more uh, aromatic, what we call more kind of muscat. But, uh, but Henrik, this, this vineyard to me is one that's kind of a throwback, isn't it? This for sure is uh, kind of stepping back in history, no doubt about it. Uh, the vineyard is located, as Bob mentioned, up on Mount Vida. Uh, it's elevated 15, 1,600 feet up, um, and it's sitting in its own little pocket. So it's, it's almost like it has its own, own little microclimate. Um, the vineyard is planted in terraces, uh, and that's something pretty unique for, for Napa when you get up in the hillsides. Uh, normally, you are allowed to, to do uh, continuous rows. Uh, the old plantings of, um, of being terraced, that's actually uh, something that is, is super rare these days. So whenever we're looking into um, redeveloping a property like, like the Drew, uh, we take the utmost care of respecting what was there when we took it over and then uh, pretty much replanting it to existing standards. Um, that alone takes a lot of planning and it's a, it's a costly process as well. So um, needless to say, the two blocks we have planted up there, uh, they average around five acres total. Had five acres been on valley floor, we would have been able to yield quite a significant amount of grapes. However, with it being planted on terraces, uh, our yields and, and uh, actual vine count is very, very minuscule. So uh, the stuff that we get out of the, uh, the Drew Vineyard is really, really near and dear to us. So we take the utmost respect when we get the fruit in and uh, just like any other Chardonnay that we, that we harvest at Alpha Omega, Everything is picked into small uh, picking bins or logs uh, and then brought into the winery early, early morning to preserve that uh, cold temperature that you normally get up on the hillsides. Um, Bob, you know a lot about this, uh, this Spring Mountain clone. Uh, tell us a little bit about more about the, the muscadine uh, element in this, please. Well, I think, Henrik, when you, when you smell Chardonnay, and of course, when we think of Muscat, we think of something that's perhaps a little bit more floral and characteristic. And I think this, this clone other, otherwise changes over time. And so that, that Muscat character kind of develops over time. It's interesting to think though, that Chardonnay actually, when you look at the parents of Chardonnay, it's believe it or not, Pinot Noir is one of the parents, Gouet Blanc is the other. And so really over time, once the Chardonnay grape developed in different places, it would start to develop different characteristics. So what I get out of this wine and a lot of this type of clone is a little bit more of those floral characteristics. But more than anything, there's a concentration of flavor that I think goes back to what you're talking about in terms of those, those 
those low yields. And that to me is what really stands up here. And we get those bright, real fresh fruit aromas here that to me speaks to a wine that's going to stand up a long period of time. And to go back to one thing you mentioned just before, Bob, uh, the decanting. I actually, I, I, I acknowledge you for coming with such a uh, recommendation. Normally not something that you would employ in, uh, in white wine, but decanting a white wine up, up in a decanter, let it uh, breathe out. Um, I think that actually opens up the aromatics even more than just uh, popping the corks. One thing that stood out to me, just as I put my nose in it, um, it almost has this, uh, these notes of uh, pencil shavings. That is something that I normally associate with, um, with red wines, uh, particularly Bordeaux. But in this wine, I think it derives from the fermentation style that we implement. So in, in not keeping this uh, overly nerdy, there's two different styles of fermenting Chardonnay. You can go into an oxidative style where you allow the yeast to have a lot of oxygen during fermentation. And then you can, as we do it with the Drew, you can go into a reductive fermentation style. That deprives the yeast of oxygen during the fermentation. And just uh, the ar aromatics and the, the flavors that comes out of that process is, is something that we really find um, uh, complements the site very well. Another reason for it to, uh, to have this scent of, um, of pencil shavings is actually the cooperage that we're using. So like any other uh, wine that is coming out of Alpha Omega, 100% into French oak. Not necessarily new French oak, but French uh, oak barrels. Uh, with our winemaking style on Chardonnay in particular, we've changed over time. So we're now going into, instead of regular size barrels, which we use for the red wines, we go into a double size uh, barrel, uh, which is called a puncheon. What that does to the wine, it, it limits its uh, impact of oak and, and wood tannins, but it allows the same amount of oxygen into the wine during uh, the elevage or, or aging in barrel. And that brings out complexity and hopefully also uh, a certain ageability in the wine. And I, I think when I smell a little bit of what you're smelling, which is that little, maybe a little bit of that pencil character, I like to think of it as, as minerality. I think that's something that we get in, certainly up there in Mount Beater with those shallower soils, but we have a little bit of that characteristic. But more than anything, to your point, the oak doesn't really stick out in this wine. I think it's something that's very much in the background and provides just a wonderful texture and really structure to the wine. But more than anything, that, that balance of fruit and, and, and oak in this case, to me, creates something that, that to me is very balanced wine. Those are the kind of wines to me that are great to drink now and have the ability to age also. Well, if you think it's sizzling, it is. It is sizzling <laughs> hot back here. Chef has got some amazing meat. Can't you, uh, I wish you could smell it. It's Well, he's it's, cooking it in butter, I can tell. Oh, <laughs> it's amazing. Wow. Oh, Lars, good, good job. Just bring on the heat. Woo. Wow, it, it smells absolutely. I don't know if I can oh. handle this being so close. This to is right really now. just. I'm going to go sit back here with the chef. <laughs> no. <laughs> really, to go back on what you said, Bob, about balance and Chardonnay, and we get this all the time from people that come in and visit Alpha Omega. They some people just they just they they think they don't understand maybe the Chardonnay variety or have had a Chardonnay that that isn't as good as some of the ones that we produce, and they tell us, hey. We don't want any Chardonnay, we'll just move on to the Reds. What does our team at Alpha Omega do? We pour them some Chardonnay because literally the way that you make this, Henrik, and the way that I think the vineyards are farmed and sourced from, there's so much balance in these wines. And we have someone on here, Austin says, it's the only Chardonnay that I'll drink. You know? <laughs> and I mean, we're, we really are kind of changing the game on Chardonnay. And, and Robin, I want to ask you about this because originally coming in you didn't really want to be known for chardonnay well because henrik was up in newton making that unfiltered unfined chardonnay and it became quite you know didn't you get a 97 i don't know they got a bunch it's of served, well served, served in, in the, the white house, house. yeah <laughs> and i said well we started this winery we didn't really want to be known as a chardonnay <laughs> house we want to be known for our a, a red wine the bordeaux style and uh, they, they just keep making great chardonnays despite what i tell them <laughs> Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, no, have, it's unbelievable. We have, we have four different Chardonnays right now in Alpha. But your your point, and it's, I've been in a number of tastings with customers here, and, and same thing. They say, "Oh, I don't want the Chardonnay." I said, "Just try it. Just have a little." And then the next thing, "Oh, this is really good. I like this." Yeah. yeah. So yeah. 
Then they want cases and we're sold yeah. out because I've bought those cases. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I know you two, uh, we, we all love our Chardonnay here at Alpha Omega. And especially this Drew, this Drew 2018, very small vineyard up on Mount Beater. How many acres, Henrik of Chardonnay planted on that vineyard? Uh, 5.63 to be exact. <laughs> wow. Here Not a think. lot of wine. Not a lot of wine. So this is a yeah. treat to be able to enjoy this and share this with you. Um, absolutely incredible. I well, on, on that right point, now, real, real quick, uh, when we bought the Drew Vineyard, uh, a number of winemakers and uh, fellow vintners came to me and said, whatever you do, don't take out, because they think we'll take out the Chardonnay put in cab. Don't do it. It's the best. They said to me, best Chardonnay in Napa. So yeah. Henry, talk about, you know, the reason why, I mean, it's the, the cooler climate, the fog. I mean, did we get snow up there this year? Yeah, we did. <laughs> and not quite this year, but um, it, it's at some point, yes, on some vintages, you will actually be able to see a little bit of a white on, on top of Mount Vida. Uh, now, since my former employment at Newton Vineyard came into uh, to mentioning today, uh, this was actually a site that we uh, that we worked with when I was at Newton Vineyard prior to uh, starting up um, Alpha Omega back in 2006. So we had uh, the knowledge of, of this spectacular site, and it was uh, uh, when when the option came to to again source from this site, uh, it, we we didn't hesitate. We we grabbed that right away. Um, I think I think that is uh, that stands out for me as well in in this wine as probably the, the signature style of Alpha Omega Chardonnay's uh, is that bright natural acidity. And <clears throat> to Michelle's comments about mm -hmm. uh, uh, the site up there, when you get into cold climate uh, growing regions, uh, say Carneros or, or Jameson Canyon, where we also saw some Chardonnay from, uh, when you get into those colder areas, that, uh, that coldness uh, during the, especially nights, actually helps us retain natural acidity in the wine. And um, again, without getting too geeky, uh, there's two balances uh, primarily of, of acid in a, in, a, in a white varietal. Those are malic and lactic acids. Uh, and often in times where you have direct sun exposure, uh, especially on Chardonnay, you're gonna uh, tend to, we call it burn off acidity. And that's not always uh, uh, desirable. So, what we're doing up at Drew is actually, uh, we have cane pruned the vineyard. That means that we are uh, stretching long canes out. And on these canes, you have both the clusters, but you also have the leaves. And with that leaf cover that naturally occurs on a long, long cane, uh, we protect the, uh, the grapes or the clusters from uh, direct sunlight. And I think that uh, is reason that we can retain such a natural acidity in the wine. So. So whenever we see the, the fruit, whenever we get the results through our uh, lab at harvest time, there's rarely any uh, need to adjust anything uh, with, uh, with artificial uh, additions. So, uh, so I think again, um, when, when you're working with quality fruit, uh, needless to say the old saying of quality or wine is made in the vineyards. I think especially with Rue Vineyard, it's, um, it comes true. Love it. And Maybe the best compliment of all, while we, we truly believe here at Alpha Omega that Napa Valley is producing some of the best wines in the world, certainly one of our Air Elite members, Trevor, just said that this tastes, that it reminds him much of a Pellini Montrachet. Wow. Right? And I mean, that, that hits right there. I mean, yeah. I, I agree with Trevor G. It has the acidity, the minerality uh, of, 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 of Pellini Montrachet, and we love that style of Chardonnay for sure, and we love what Napa is producing. So, uh, well, and that's good to hear because uh, we had this property under option for a number of years and we closed and we own it now. We closed on December 30, 2020. Uh, so it's now ours and it'll be here for years to come. Looking forward cheers to, to that. Drew. Yeah, cheers to that. We'll raise a, raise a glass of more Drew. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you, bankers. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you all are enjoying that Drew Chardonnay. I know we all are here. Uh, I literally cannot concentrate uh, anymore from the smells that we're getting from oh, Chef Lars. So we're going to pass it over to Chef Lars and Master Salmian. Thank you, Barrett. I'm here with Chef Lars Kronmark. 
from the Culinary Institute of America at Greystone. Lars, thanks for sharing this with us today. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure to work with you, Bob. Well, it, and you're one of the very first employees at the CIA Greystone, weren't you? That's right. Uh, I opened the school back in 95, and uh, it, it seems a very long time ago, but uh, you know, we're going strong, and uh, we're very busy. That's a quick 25 years. Oh, very quick. And, uh, we, we enjoy the valley. We enjoy the great wine. But I know you and, and Henrik share kind of a, a similar background, don't you? Yeah, the, the wine maker happened to be Danish, like I am. Oh. And we had a wonderful little conversation earlier before we started the set. And uh, we decided to get together more often because uh, we haven't done that for the last year. So, so oh. we'll do that Fan again. Fantastic. Well, today we've got kind of a, a maybe an Irish take on steak and potatoes, right? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, it is a St. Patrick's uh, uh, meal a direction and a uh, corned beef and cabbage and pastrami and, and all the good stuff that we get out of Ireland. I thought the word beef, I would, I get that. So I did, a, I want to do a, a New York steak. And the New York steak I'm doing is a, basically with a, uh, a an Irish style mashed potato with cabbage, which right. you see in your recipe package. But I'm also doing a crust. Yeah. And whenever I eat uh, 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 corned beef and cabbage, I like horseradish. I like mustard, I like pickles, I like all that stuff because I do think it makes the food big and rich. And then with the wine we're gonna pair with, I think it would be a great match. I think so too. Now I know you're doing this with uh, with a New York strip, but you yeah. can do this with just about any kind of meat, couldn't you? Yeah, you know, I thought about uh, things like, uh, obviously uh, something called a flat iron. It's a mm -hmm. really popular piece of meat nowadays. Uh, you could do it with a filet mignon. You could do it with any kind of meat that you, you want to. And you could even do this crust with a piece of uh, corned beef. Okay. If you slice, if you like, if you have a corned beef bone for this celebration, yeah. and you slice it, and you put my crust on top, and do the same thing, you could have to do a great pairing. Oh, fantastic. Let me show you how to make the crust. You, you I'd, I'd love you? to see it, exactly. Oh. So if we can just look at the meat for a second. Uh, meat is sitting out for the last half an hour to get room temperature. And then uh, I seat it off. Got a little bit of a, a fat off the meat by sitting up in the Italian pan. And uh, I had seasoned with good salt, a nice pork salt. You can use a good local sea salt, a melting salt or something like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the salting of the meat is really important because uh, this meat wants that. They need that, that saltiness in the background, they, the brininess. And you know, it's, 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 it's important to, to do it even early, even half an hour early is great. Yeah, now um, that pan's pretty important too, uh, though, isn't it? It's important, yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have a real nice big cast iron pan. It, it, uh, it might not be Irish, but it could have been. It could have been come all on the boat many, many years ago. We never know. Uh, but what I'm doing now is the steaks are getting close to be done. And the medium rare, okay, or medium, oh, yeah. medium rare. Don't okay, burn it. Are, Don't burn it. I'll turn it turning in their, their <laughs> orders. And I'm going to keep it to about a medium rare. That would be fine by everybody. Anyway, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a crust. And this crust that consists of a Dijon mustard. I like Dijon just because it's smooth and creamy, and uh, it's a good beginning for my crust. I'm going to put a couple of tablespoons in here of that uh, for the three sticks we have. Horseradish, uh, prepared horseradish is what I prefer. Should you have cream? This is the ingredients you all have at home. So I'll try to do something that is not too uh, exotic. You, can, you can't find it anywhere. So horseradish is definitely one I want to use. Horseradish and uh, and mustard, but creamy mustard must be okay too. I mean, you could do that. Okay. Let people like that. It's a little softer maybe. Yeah. Uh, lots of herbs. Many people have good herb gardens right now. Uh, you know, chai. This is actually just parsley. I love parsley in this dish. I do have some chai too. So let's try some of those two in here. There we go. And uh, and then I add some breadcrumbs. Now the breadcrumbs. Uh, can be panko or can be your regular breadcrumbs you have in the freezer uh, or wherever you keep them. I usually keep mine in the freezer because they don't, they don't turn rancid that way and I don't use them that often. Now I'm going to mix this together. I'm going to fill my steak off and this dish, this steak, medium round. I'm going to mix this together into a cake with the butter. So I'm going to add a little bit of butter into my steak. There we go. And as this is melting, I'm going to pour some of this butter into my crust. There we go. Ah. You see this? Yeah. What we're doing now, we're getting a little bit of the flavor all mixed together, right? There we go. And uh, when you see the recipes that we're going to send to you, you're going to see that you're going to need an oven. Oh, well, we don't have an oven here in the vineyard. You can see behind me, there's no <laughs> oven here. 
<laughs> so uh, we're going to make an oven by using something like I have that took from the CIA the other day. I borrowed it. <laughs> uh, this is actually a creme brulee burner or of, of this is something maybe you have at home. It's called a torch. And this torch here can create a lot of nice heat. I'm going to use that. Bob, can you hold this for a second? I'd be happy that, to. That would be great. Thank sure, you. No problem. You hold that just like okay. that. I'm going to put all the crust on my sticks. You see this crust here? It's the same picture as uh, perhaps sour cream, but it consists of, as I said earlier, horseradish, mustard, breadcrumbs, herbs of your choice. If you like all of herbs, I like the green herbs just because I think they're really mellow and they make work great with a rich steak. So look at this. Right, we got all this on here, and I'm going to take this torch. Oh, it feels good right now. So in the recipe, you can put this in the broiler, salamander, and you can brown it. Well, we're going to actually go ahead and brown it with <laughs> my torch. And actually, this is going to get a nice little crust on it, and that is what, what's going to make it kind of come out and be, you know, be done eventually. And, and uh, it gets you uh, a nice look. And you can slice the steak afterwards if you want to. And I'm going to serve this uh, tonight with a beautiful mashed potato mixed with cabbage or leek. You saw I have a display here on my right. And uh, in Ireland, they use a lot of leeks, cabbage, uh, kale. And they're often mixed with the potato. Potato is a staple in, in Ireland. But certainly, because you can see here already, I'm getting some brown crust on it. And uh, we're going to take a few more minutes. If you do this at home in the oven, your oven is going to be about 400 degrees, right? And, uh, and I, all, I, I usually stick in the broiler and give it about a minute or two in the broiler. But you've got to make sure the steak is only seeing the outside because the oven also can cook it. And you can put that cast iron pan right in the oven. Oh, yeah, right in the oven, exactly. Yeah. Okay, we took it already here. And I've done this uh, with different kinds of pieces that earlier. It's really easy to do. And you saw how fast that was as long as you have the ingredients ready. All right, here we go. There we go. I think we got the first one here for one of our special kits for this, right? There we go. I'll put this all here next to you, Bob. And I'm gonna make a nice plate for everybody. Are we ready for that? Okay. There we go. So on our plate, we're gonna take our stick. We're gonna take this. Uh, I think we took the stick here right here. Oh, so, I thought that one was for me. Oh no! I think <laughs> we have a special guest coming in today. I think we're gonna do that. So anyway, I make the potatoes earlier. I want you to show you real quickly. The potato is uh, your regular mashed potato recipe, but I have to do it for. I actually like to use something called Savoy cabbage, which is kind of a softer cabbage. Yeah, that's good for you too, that cabbage, isn't oh, it? Yeah, I love this. Wow. Oh, that's good. I think this is just great. Now you just cook that cabbage up a little bit ahead of time, then just fold yeah, it in with yeah, the potatoes? Yeah, I plant it in soft yeah. water and then pour it into the potatoes. And then the steak, to make the steak look really cool and nice looking, I'm going to break my knife yeah. over here, Bob, real quick. Is I could slice the steak up in a slices like this. See what this goes. Beautiful color inside. Look at that, right? Two, three, and four. Now I'm going to put this up to the side here. I'm going to see the steak. Go. Go. And then one over here. And I can see right now, and we are just about ready. A little bit of chives on top of the potato. You could put extra butter on top, but I think there's no butter here already, right? <laughs> so. I think about that, Bob. I, I think uh, there's a, a very lucky person who's going to be receiving yeah, that very so soon. I, I, I would that with a nice glass of cabinet. I think it's a great pairing. Would you like to give to somebody? Fantastic. Why don't you take it over right, and share with that, right. Father Donald? Here. Probably, hopefully, I've been smelling the steak the last five, ten minutes, as mm -hmm. the rest of the guests have. And um, uh, Donald, how are you today? This is driving me unconscious right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? This is all for you. And uh, uh, I, I will enjoy your, your, your comments. I'll enjoy your, uh, your wine pairing. I know we have some great wines for you that, oh. show that uh, uh, Mr. Bob Bass will talk a little bit through here in a few minutes. But this is the way to celebrate St. Patrick. 
It's yours. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Great. Thank you for coming. Well, uh, my joy. This is, it's, don't be jealous. Don't be jealous. <laughs> We're all well, jealous. We're all jealous. You, you know, we, we uh, had a conversation a few years ago, and, and you and Robin and I, we've known each other 15 years, and you were part of our wedding and, um, and our marriage. And I recall talking about my mother's corned beef and cabbage on St. Patrick's Day, and you said, that's a myth. <laughs> so I love that you're tasting this wonderful food and this great, I mean, wonderful chef that started uh, the CIA culinary uh, team and that you have an opportunity to taste this. I'd like to get into a little story a little bit later after we uh, enjoy some more wines about how we came to know each other and uh, through the Rancho Vistadores yeah. and Robin's cowboy hat. His so, Irish uh, cowboy hat. I in just, a minute, not yet. We're going I'm not going wine. to that. I just want to follow up on the myth. So father, in Ireland, do they have corned beef and cabbage? Robin. Yes. I think you've been drinking too much good wine. They don't. <laughs> they, that's what we... Robin, you, I, you, so you, that's American-made. American-made. Robin, I know corned beef and cabbage until I put my feet in the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of it. What is no. corned beef and cabbage? The people of Ireland, in the old days, they loved their bacon. Bacon and cabbage. Leek mm -hmm. and cabbage. But corned beef? That's an abomination. <laughs> Well, yeah, I would, I would say we. Need, I think we it, need to have a drink to, to <laughs> now for your suggestion. <laughs> Here's to Drew. I, I, I think it's the cattle in America that established the corned beef because <laughs> they can't. <laughs> I think you have making a good point, Lars. This is amazing, and these smells are incredible, and I can't wait for my turn. <laughs> this is beautiful. Back now, concentrate on good food and beautiful wine while you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> love it. Thank you. Love it. Thank you, Chef Lars and Batman. And here is extreme. Oh. Um, so have here. Exactly. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, restored in Old Victorian in the Buckhead area of Atlanta. And she decided to move to New York, rented an apartment, invited me up for the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And the parade was one of the largest parades I've ever seen of Irish first responders. And we had such an amazing experience. And I'm like, I'm crying because I'm so grateful to all of our first responders and our firemen and our police department. And they're all marching down and the bands that were playing and all of the wonderful music. And it started snowing and snowing and snowing. And it was not predicted that that would happen. And we were not dressed for snow. So we ran to an Irish pub, which there are a lot of those in New York. And I go sit to the bar with my friends and we're ordering a hot toddy to warm us up. That would be whiskey, right, Patties? What's your favorite, Father Donald? Jameson. <laughs> Jameson. And so like um, uh, one of the firemen that, that was there after the parade finished, they all came into these Irish bars were flooded with these great first responders. And I was talking to them and I was saying, you know, I'm so grateful for all of your work. And this was back in the 90s. So grateful for what you do for our country. So grateful for all the things you do to take care of our communities. And one of the firefighters ran out the door and they have on not, you know, not their firefighting suits, they have on their wonderful little uniforms and runs out the door and he goes down to a market that has produce and he comes in in the middle of the snow and it was this deep and he hands me a peach because I'm from Georgia 
and he says, you are a Georgia peach. Wow. <laughs> that's a good one. So that's my well favorite played. St. Patrick's Day story. <laughs> well played. What about you, boss? Oh, it's funny. You I didn't, I one? didn't, I didn't plan for this, but I have one that's kind of funny. It's, it's with my son. And oh, have, you don't want to tell this one. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but we happened to be in uh, Waikiki, Hawaii uh, during St. Patty's Day. And we wake up in the morning and said, well, we got to find an Irish bar. Well, they do have one in, in Waikiki. So we head down to this bar, I don't know, about three o'clock or something. But my son had just turned 21. He was at the University of Arizona. And he, just, he decided after the first drink, he's going to, hey, dad, I got to show you how to drink. I go, oh, you're going to show me. Okay, anyway. So anyway, so it was, it was uh, he kept thinking he could out drink me and that ain't <laughs> happening. But in any event, it got to be about six o'clock and it's time to go to dinner. Well, he's gone. He is just, and he's obnoxious and just. Don't and, be, be nice. Okay. He's no, watching. He's on right now. I don't know. We left him. He's, <laughs> so, they, they are gonna left. Have, they're going to have a baby in June. So I'll <laughs> leave it. That, that, but that, the, it was the, a father, son, 21st birthday, St. Patrick's Day crawl yeah, in anyway. Honolulu. But we left him. But the funny story, no, we go, we're, we're staying at the Holly no, Claudi. We're having dinner story. outside. I'm not telling the rest of it. And I'm going to do the finish. <laughs> but we're out and then we see him come walking down the beach. And he's, if you call it a walk, we all duck down and hide so he doesn't see us so we can enjoy our dinner. <laughs> and there's more. No, but I'm not going to tell the rest of the story. That's okay. it. That's <laughs> good, honey. That's good. It. St. Patty's Day in Hawaii. Uh, okay. <laughs> that, well, that was kind of unscripted. I and he, was that uh, no, 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 and he's, no, he's a ranchero too, Father. He's so, also yeah. a ranchero. Father Donald knows him. Um, so Barrett, Love it. Love I think it. we should ask all of our viewers to chat box us on what is their favorite experience, St. Patrick's Day, their most memorable experience, or what they look forward to for St. Patrick's Day. What's that one tradition they love? I love corned beef and cabbage. I'm just saying I love corned beef and cabbage. Yeah, we, we want that to could be another favorite. magnum. That could be not the best yeah. experience. The best experience listed for St. Patrick's Day from our guests. Let's what, do that. What's yours, yeah. Barrett? Uh, uh, from what I can remember, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to live uh, near Savannah, Georgia for a few years before I moved out to California. And I, I think two years in a row went to the Savannah, Georgia, St. Patrick's Day parade. And that was unlike any other parade uh, that I've ever done for St. Patrick's Day. Close second would be South Side of Chicago. That's rowdy. Uh, you're lucky to get out of there alive. Uh, but I think Savannah, Georgia, uh, St. Patrick's Day celebration mm -hmm. is the one that I remember the most. So let's get into the next wine and then let's uh, check in with Henrik and Bob. Okay. And Lars and Father Donald on their favorite St. Patrick's Day. Love it. Love it. We'll ask them here shortly when we, uh, during or after we taste our, our next wine. But before we dive into these two Cabernet Sauvignons, really excited. This is kind of a mini vertical of our 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon and our 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon. We got to go back to trivia question number one, because these always get highly contested. They get serious. They get competitive. Uh, we do have a winner. Okay. Our winner for the trivia question we have, what is our answer to our first trivia question, Robin? <laughs> why do we wear green on the because Day? why why do leprechauns pinch yeah 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 because if you don't wear green if you if you if green makes you invisible right to makes the leprechauns, you invisible. that's right and the leprechauns will pinch you yeah. so we had a lot of people that said uh green makes you visible we had a lot of people oh, that said so you don't get pinched uh but the one person that got it the fastest was uh, Carol Haldewang. Carol Haldewang, Magnum of 2018 Oakville. Yay, Carol. Cabernet Sauvignon coming your way. Cheers. Coming oh, your way. Great. We got a lot of angry people out there uh, in the chat box that wish they won. But <laughs> we've got we've got two more Magnums to, uh, to give away. One for our next trivia question coming up. One for best attire, best setup for our St. Patrick's Day virtual tasting. But I thought uh, we added another one. Did you you want to do another one for the best uh, experience. best experience in St. Patrick's Day? I thought Day. we added that. They're coming in. You, okay, you just did. Done. We're, we're throwing curveballs here. I love it. 
Uh, but let's get on that. Let's before we get into our Cabernet Sauvignon 2017, Robin, we've got another trivia question. What do you got? Uh, okay. This is going to be a little easier because I feel sorry for you guys. That was a little tricky. So, you know, uh, two days after uh, the, a famous, you know, the uh, it's March 17th. And uh, two days before that is the Ides of March. Beware of the Ides of March. You know, that changed the course of human hi Roman history when they uh, assassinated Julius Caesar, all those senators. That was not very nice. Uh, but anyway, uh, why... Why, who do we celebrate the 17th? What is the reason for that? Why do we celebrate St. Patrick's Day yeah, on the 17th? On the 17th, exactly. Why? What, what is significant about that date? Oh, it's coming in hot. I oh, think we already have a winner. I knew we I, it got, came in quick. I feel bad about these. Some of these are too easy. Uh, the first one was actually kind of uh, difficult, yeah. uh, but let me to go back to our first trivia question real quick, because we had some funny answers. One person answered because of Irish spring uh, soap. <laughs> Ooh, that's a, that's good, a good one. one. <laughs> and then another person answered, and this is going to hit you, and they, you might give them some of this, because of Cal Poly. Where it's Cal Poly Green and gold. Oh, yeah. Speaking of that, I hate to deviate a little bit, but this is really important with my mom and dad. Uh, Two weeks ago, Cal Poly beat USC two out of three in baseball. And my dad was SC, wanted me to go there. I didn't go there, went to Cal Poly. And last night, Cal Poly beat UCLA where my mom went. And we got to, hey, everybody's got a root for Cal Poly today or tomorrow to win one more. So we have two series where we knock off UCLA and USC. UCLA was ranked number six yesterday. They probably now, <laughs> now. <laughs> anyway, it was a great game. And uh Go we Polly. Like sport, Go we Polly. like your sports commentary. That's yeah. always welcome on a weekend on a Saturday. <laughs> oh, it's a, paying we, respect to my mom and dad. There we go. And Cal Poly. <laughs> and Cal Poly. And Cal Poly. We love Cal Poly. Because mom wanted Cal me to go to America. UCLA. And I went to Cal Poly. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. So uh, we, I believe we do have a winner for trivia. We'll announce it in a bit. We're getting some great uh, St. Patrick's Day experiences that our guests have had. Keep those coming in. We love seeing them. Uh, and we'll pick out some fun ones to... Uh, to talk about here in a bit, but I know, you, I know you all are excited about these two reds, uh, our Cabernet Sauvignon from Alpha Omega, starting with our 2017, uh, smelling absolutely delicious. Bob, what are your thoughts uh, on this 17 Cabernet? Well, first of all, Barrett, I, I just, I love the idea or the on opportunity today of, of really trying two vintages next to each other and two vintages really with fairly similar composition in terms of grapes and fairly similar in terms of winemaking. So what you're really seeing here is the vintage difference and, and what a difference a year makes. But to me, what I'm really excited about is really the 17. I kind of had really already high expectations for the 18. It's, it's going to be fabulous. But the 17 was, was one of those vintages, again, where timing was, was crucial. Uh, it's not as consistent a vintage as the 18. And I really love where the 17 is today. But I think when you smell them, you'll notice that the, the oak is starting to integrate a little bit, just one year older. And already we see that really a little bit more of that dark fruit a very strong red fruit element in this wine. I, I love the fact that aromatically, we're already starting to reach some complexity with this wine, but uh, Henrik, uh, not the easiest year to work with. Uh, that's a slight understatement. Um, very challenging uh, growing season. Uh, well, I shouldn't say growing season because up until uh, Labor Day in September, we actually had a pretty smooth sailing in, in 2017. Um, however, I always believe that a challenging vintage, that's actually where, where good winemakers will strive and uh, they will shine. So um, when tasting this uh, now uh, close to two years after bottling, uh, I, I think we actually nailed it exactly where we wanted it to be. It is going to be a vintage that is um, heavily affected by the, the heat spells that we have had over Labor Day. We literally had 12 days with a, a triple digit temperatures. And I think at night, if I recall um, from my sweaty dreams, uh, we didn't, we rarely uh, dipped uh, below 80 degrees at night. So that was something that really, really stressed uh, the vines and get into vines, uh, triple digits. Uh, they will simply just like human beings, they wanna shut down and then go into uh, early hibernation. The same thing happened with us uh, in, in 2017. So our, uh, our first picks were already in-house when we saw this uh, heat spell, but the rest of the grapes, 
we let them sit through this heat spell because we, we were uh, determined that we couldn't pick or bring in underripe grapes. So we wanted to take the gamble and, and bring them in after they had uh, sat through those 12 days. Um, needless to say that uh, with, uh, with high temperatures, gr uh, grapes are shriveling. So we were able to bring in uh, probably 80% of what we would normally have done uh, of grapes that vintage. And I think that concentration uh, or limited uh, yields, um, reduced tonnage, that actually shows in the wine because this is way more concentrated than I ever expected to turn out. So, uh, so that's a little bit of, of the vintage characteristics uh, for me that I see in this wine. Uh, now, I know we shouldn't jump into the 18, but I just had a, had a sip to compare. And I think just to your point, Bob, I think that the, the fascination of having two vintages neck to neck, uh, you really, really see what winemaking is all about because the, the fruit material, the sources uh, for these two wines are, are basically identical. So, so this is Mother Nature showing uh, what, what she gave us to work with in, uh, in 17 and in 18. And I, I completely agree with you, Henrik. And I think one of the things that really shows in this 17 is really the, the multiple sources that we have for fruit. In other words, having hillside, having valley floor, having mountaintop, I think in a vintage like 17, you needed to have that variety of, of vineyards because really the heat spell, particularly on the Valley Four, obviously is going to be much more intense than it would be, say, up on the hillsides or in the mountaintops. So that, that variety of vineyard sources to me was, was one of the saving graces of, of 17. And I'm just thinking, you know, smelling and tasting this 17, I'm thinking, Lars, what's going to go better with that, that New York strip steak? I think this one's going to go a little bit better because it really, to me, has a little bit more of those kind of grounded tannins. To me, it's, it's really got that wonderful uh, depth of flavor now to stand up, particularly to that, that pistachio crush. And when we're talking about that, I think that's really kind of something that really will make this really, really fun in terms of food. No, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and again, not uh, to dip into the 18 too early, but I think uh, it's, it's actually fascinating for me to taste them side by side and actually seeing that for my personal uh, uh, palate, I think I would actually dig into the 18s before I finish my 17s. And that's a thing that, um, something that I learned when I was working back in, in France, in Bordeaux. Um, you don't necessarily have to be true to vintages or, or drink them in, in uh, consecutive order. You should drink them whenever they are ready. And for me, that 2017, that's something that can easily stand the test of time. So I would put these bottles in the back of my cellar and then maybe enjoy the 18s or even the, the Chardonnay um, a little bit sooner than, uh, than this 17. I don't know, Henrik, I might have to disagree. I think I'm gonna drink this 17 right now <laughs> and get some more. This wine is almost sold out, by the way, everyone. This is the very, this is probably the last offering of our 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon. And Henrik and I kind of poke fun at each other about aging wine, so that it's sort of an inside joke. But I mean, it's amazing how drinkable our Cabernet Sauvignons are, Henrik, at such a young age. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with, and correct me if I'm wrong, with your winemaking style and open top barrel fermentation, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, half of the secret uh, in, in, in the Alpha Omega style is, um, is our barrel fermentation. So what it does, um, in, in short, I think I have a explain there might be some newcomers to, to these segments. Uh, what barrel fermentation is that we, we literally use uh, regular French oak barrels, um, stand them on their heads, uh, remove the rims, take out the head, and then put the rims back up to seal uh, these barrels. And then we use them as literally like small uh, wooden fermenters or, or oak tanks, if you like. Um, and that, um, that process, um, needless to say, it's very, very labor extensive because you, you have such a small amount of grapes inside a barrel that, that the volume that you're getting in finished wines is very, very uh, minuscule. But what it does to the wine is that it integrates the oak uh, and the tannin in the, in, the, in the oak at a very early stage. So you can say that um, I like to compare it when, when I go out during harvest and taste different fermentations uh, um, uh, throughout harvest. 
at stainless steel tank, that's something where I really need to use my brain because that has not been exposed to oak at this point. So whenever our decisions to, to do pump overs or aerations or punch downs or so on uh, on a stainless steel tank, I, in the back of my head, need to think, where's this wine going to be after it sits in an oak barrel for two years? Now, on the other hand, with barrel fermentation, it's fairly simple because you have everything uh, right there in front of you. You have the oak, you have the integration of oak, and you have the, the fermentation, you have the fruitiness uh, coming out of the varietals. So it's, um, in lack of better words, it's more of a complete package when you do this barrel fermentation. And I think that aids us uh, on the winemaking team a little bit uh, better uh, because we know where the wine is going to take uh, and hopefully uh, see where it's going to develop uh, over uh, two years. Yeah, love it. And question real quick for you, Bob Bath. We have one of our guests on here, Peter Turner, uh, kind of going back to Henrik's uh, comment on aging wine and, and really sort of cellaring wines. The 2017 era, I'm just thinking about the 17 minutes, our era, our flagship wine, best in show in decanters top 50. I mean, unbelievable score from a vintage that I think a lot of people wrote off wrongfully so. Peter Turner, uh, going back to the aging California or Napa Cabernet Sauvignon, Peter Turner has a 2013 or has a few bottles of 2013 era in his cellar. And he's saying, should I, should we drink or save? When's the best year to enjoy that wine from that vintage, Bob? Well, again, I think with, with any wine and, and so often I'm asked, uh, when should I have this wine? And so often it seems like people want to know what year, what month, what day, what hour. Uh, <laughs> and it really, wine isn't that way. Wine has a, a, a lifetime and it has a, a really a, a sweet spot, so to speak, in terms of, of peaking. But that peak may go on for sometimes several years. And the beauty is that, that a lot of, of Napa Valley wines peak a little bit earlier, certainly maybe earlier than, say, Bordeaux wines, but they stay there a long time also. So I think it comes down to what you really like in wine. A lot of people like to have that, that upfront fruit. And to me, a lot of that, those wines, and now we're reaching with that 2013, we're just reaching that seven, eight year span. To me, this is really the wine now that's in its sweet spot. So it's really still going to be uh, have that, that strong core of fruit. After this now, that's going to gradually diminish. So I think that's the thing is, if you like them a little bit more on the fruitier style, I drink it now. But the 13 vintage, and you can talk to a lot of winemakers in Napa Valley, they love 13. Um, I think it's still gonna hold up beautifully. And so I, I would, uh, particularly have a couple of bottles, I find a special occasion this year, enjoy that 13 and, and see if it has that kind of fruitiness that you like, because it's really kind of subjective, it's up to you. But I think more than anything, you're gonna start to see more changes over the next 10 years now than have happened in that first seven or eight. Love it. And one more quick question before we've got a special performance here before our Cabernet Sauvignon in 2018. And this is a great question for you, Henrik. Uh, and, and I know everything in the winemaking process uh, matters in the end. Chris has a question, the significance of the yeast that we use and the type of uh, oak barrels that we use. I mean, I've talked with you on this before. Uh, those have a major factor in how the wine is uh, produced, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, yeast is, is um, it, it, it's a contributing factor to the personality of the wine. So what we do here at Alpha Omega is we don't want to put all our uh, eggs in one basket. So we kind of play around with different yeast strings. Uh, we we uh, kind of adapt them to the sites that we have um, and very much to the varietal that we have. So uh, of course, big difference between red and white wine, but uh, on the reds, we are experimenting uh, or using on average uh, three to four different yeast strings. Uh, that combined with sometimes a little bit of natural fermentations or native yeast fermentation, uh, which is using the yeast that is naturally occurring out in the vineyard and, and kind of starting up fermentations on that before we inoculate. That also gives um, uh, a, a certain aromatic profile to the wines. Um, one thing that I am very concerned about is um, I don't want to be uh, a winemaker that comes in and changes anything. So I think we need to respect the vineyards as much as possible and the, the varietal as much as possible. And that's uh, one of the reasons that we are uh, spread out uh, over the 12 of the 16 AVAs in, in Napa at this point. So we're sourcing from a lot of different um, sites. 
And we're also bringing in a lot of different clones to, to that uh, mix. Then throw on top of that different cooperages uh, sourced from all over France. And um, that combined with different yeast strings, that adds up to, uh, to the complexity of our wine. And like I always say, despite Alpha Omega being such a uh, fairly small producer as we are, uh, in 2018 vintage, we had over 800 different uh, fermentations going on. And when I talk to my colleagues out in the, in the valley, uh, they are right away guessing on, on the uh, total production of, uh, of our wines. And I'm like, yeah, some of these lots were one barrel, some of them were two barrels. And they, they just, they take themselves to the head and they walk away like we're insane. But we go that extra mile uh, only for one purpose, quality and, um, and to, to make uh, the wines more complex uh, over time. Awesome. Quality over quantity for yeah, sure. For sure. Alpha Omega. Uh, well, there's the big producers would take all the wine we make and do it in one fermentation. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great Get question, it. Chris. Yeah. Thank you, Henrik, for, for answering that. Um, we've got, I hope you guys enjoyed this 2017 Cabernet Sauvignon mm. again. Uh, very drinking incredible right now, in my opinion. Almost out of this wine. Uh, we will have a follow up offer for you all after our tasting. Make sure you secure some of this 2017. Before we go into our 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon, we've got another special performance here from our Irish dancers. So as you kind of segue into the Cabernet Sauvignon 2018, enjoy this uh, little performance here. Back to the outside amazing area that is Alpha Omega Winery. And we hope you're enjoying the wine tasting and where the girls are about to entertain you with a treble reel. Girls, Hain, Doe, three, Right on. That was awesome. Not something you see every day, hey, boss? You got Irish dancers out on the uh, terrace. Over That's the pretty good. Where's Michelle? Michelle. I'm putting on my jacket. <laughs> okay. Oh, Michelle, Michelle dances like that, too. She I was going to say, that. I thought Michelle she, was going to be uh, doing a little uh, there. <laughs> yeah, look at her. See, she can do it. Love it. I love watched it. a lot of River Dance uh, yeah. growing up. It's, it's pretty yeah, amazing. that and was great. You, you go through your Ancestry.com and you find your roots. And and I, my grandfather was Irish until I found out that we're Scottish. <laughs> but, hey, Barrett, I got to, I mean, uh, for those that are new, they might think this is a faux backdrop, right? It's the real deal. It's real. Yeah, yeah it's we've real. had some some guests on our virtual tastings uh, assume that this was a fake backdrop. I mean, no. it's absolutely unbelievable back here in our crush pad. Get a, an unbelievable view of the, the eastern side of, of the Rutherford Appalachian where we're located. And then Pritchard Hill behind us. Uh, Always and, a shout out to our friends in Chapelais. But it is, it is, if you just go over the knolls, you'll be right at Quintessa on Silverado Trail. Yeah. And uh, this is a beautiful part of Rutherford. And we're right, right here in the heart of Napa Valley, the edge of the Rutherford bench, um, a beautiful place. What do you think, Bob? Well, you know, as I've always said, Michelle, if I'm a Cabernet Sauvignon grape, this is where I want to live. Uh, <laughs> this is the best address you could possibly have. And I think as we go into this 2018, you start to see proof positive of that. I mean, to me, it's, it's, first of all, when you look at 17 and 18, you see the consistency of this region, just in terms of, of really the quality of wines. But then every now and then a vintage like 18 comes along and you just say, oh my gosh, this is, this is really what Cabernet Sauvignon. And let's face it, there's more Cabernet Sauvignon planted in the world than any other grape. But right here, right in a vintage like 18, I, I just, I can't say enough about this. And it's so exciting. And the wine feed today is, is, a, 
is it's a lot of that really dark blackberry fruit. But to me, it's it's a little oaky today. It's something that's going to need time, and yet it's wonderful today. And I love that that beauty of it. There's so many wines where when you look at other great wines of the world, whether it's Bordeaux or Barolo or something like that, you got to wait. You don't have to wait here. And I think this is particularly somebody like Barrett, for example, his 18s aren't going to be around very long. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. For me, I'm going to hold on to these for a long time. And these are wines that my children are going to drink and they're going to love just as much. And I just love that. That's the one box that we haven't checked yet in California or in the world. And that's that our wines can age. And these are the kind of wines that are gonna prove that. Well, Bob, Andre Chalachev said, it takes great Rutherford dust to make great Cabernet. And you should Google Andre Chalachev. What a great winemaker. He understood the vineyards. He, 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 he is such a savant of, of Napa Valley Cabernets. And there's a great um, uh, film that was made by his great nephew that's out. And yeah. it's, it's a long one. But it's so worthy to watch um, agriculture and families and generations of families that that really dig their hands into the earth. Yeah, he was the first, believe it or not, the first to ever make 100% Cabernet in Napa Valley. That was not the case back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. No, you know, when, when he came in, in, I think it was 38, if I'm not mistaken, or 36, uh, well, he was found literally by George de la Tour, who went over to France and found him and really brought him back. And, and wines had been popular at that point, the wines like sparkling Muscat. Cabernet Sauvignon was something that they had in the cellar there. And, if, and he was the one who basically said, this is going to be great wine. And he, could, he had that premonition already. And to think that if he hadn't been there, uh, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, the, the mentorship that he did also, not only the great wines he made at Beaulieu, but the mentorship he did, I can't tell how many winemakers have said, I had this time with Andre, and to them it was, uh, it was to the, the perfect kind of, of mentorship, and I think that's now being passed on, so he was the one who really started it all. Cheers, Andre. Yeah, and to Rutherford Dust. And to Rutherford, <laughs> absolutely beautiful, and yeah. as, we, as we go into this, this 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon, and, and really dive, dive into it, I mean, Bob, the vintage, everything you want in a vintage, really, out of Napa Valley. Long, long growing season, kind of slow and steady, right, Henrik? And, I mean, we had an early bud break in 18, and we were harvesting fruit, I believe, into the beginning of November, correct? Yeah, I think the last picking day we did in 2018 was probably 4th of November, something like that. And that is really pushing it for us. But um, I recall the first uh, rain started around the 14th, 15th of November. So we literally could have pushed it a little bit more. But like anything else we do, it's based on, uh, on ripeness in the vineyards and it's based on, uh, on taste. And at that point, uh, we felt it was the right time to bring in the grapes. So uh, um, as a vintage, um, it's, it's kind of a, don't get me wrong, I love this vintage, but as a, from a winemaking perspective, it's kind of a little bit of a, a hit and miss. It's, there was nothing really, there was no real um, huge uh, weather uh, issues or, or uh, things that, that could throw off. Uh, there wasn't any heat spells over summer that we normally see. So it was kind of a, a vintage where winemakers um, early on, we looked at each other and we're like, is this really gonna be anything good? But lo and behold, as fruit was starting to come in, I don't think we tasted the, the quality as much in the vineyard as we did when, uh, when lots were going through fermentation. So um, I, I went on record early on on saying this is probably one of the best vintages in Napa ever. Um, last year was my 21st, uh, hands down. 2018 is the, the best I've had the privilege of working with. So I've asked a couple of old timers in the valley they refer back to, to 91. And I think there was even one that uh, went back to the 50s to find a, a vintage that he would compare 18 to. Um, so long story short on that, it's a spectacular vintage and it has all the, the attributes, all the right things that winemakers are looking for in a vintage. It has early accessibility. It has a, 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 a very high uh, percentage of fruitiness in the wines. And that's something that uh, early, it, it will uh, um, give the wines an early drinkability, but it will also um, make them stand the test of time and, and really give them a long drinking window. So 
uh, Barrett, you and I, we always go, go through these uh, discussions <laughs> about whether we want to put them in the back of our cellar or we want to enjoy them now. I think for me, this is probably a vintage that I can drink both now, but also that I hope to be enjoying uh, around friends and family 30, 40 years from now. I got to add, Henrik, has, he's been the leader in, in this vintage and he has an expression and it's really good. He said, take out a second mortgage, back up the pickup truck and buy all you can. <laughs> He's still your line. <laughs> I, I, and I mean, again, it's uh, like I always say when, when I'm in front of a, a camera, I'm not here to sell wine. I'm here to talk about wine. So my recommendations are solely based on what I taste and what I can recommend you wine lovers out there uh, where you spend your, uh, your discretionary income. For me, I've always been way more on wine than I should, but uh, <laughs> when, when I was uh, uh, given the opportunity to buy deep in on the 90 vintage from Bordeaux, uh, that, that took out a, a decent, uh, sizable chunk of my savings at that time. <laughs> if I were in the same position at this point, I would probably do the same with 2018 General Relief and Napa Valley. Cool. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, they drink well young, they'll age in the cellar, that's why the only way that I can kind of take care of my issue in my cellar is just to buy a lot. Uh, and we actually, we have a lot of people on here that are tasting, you know, these, the 17 and the 18 next to each other. They're both obviously delicious wines, but we have a lot of people on here going, okay, we need to stock up on the 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon. And, and rightfully so. I mean, first I got to raise a glass to Robin and Michelle first 100 point score oh. on the 2018 oh, wow. Fex Stop for wow. Cabernet Sauvignon yes. 99 point score on the era our flag well I always round up <laughs> <laughs> 99 basically 100 right I'm sorry, yeah. but the point is and obviously the Alpha Omega is not making wines based off scores because really you're handcrafting wines top to bottom uh, and we've been doing that for years but to, Henrik to be vindicated in his early prediction of the 18 vintage yep. and the wines right now are just, they're delicious. It's incredible. They are fantastic. And you're right. Uh, we don't um, market our wine on scores. We really count on mother nature to deliver what we, what we need to make sure that we enjoy the wines. Our winemakers are having fun with the wines, our customers and our Alpha Omega families enjoying the wines. So we count on mother nature and then we also like the critics when they're when they're happy with the wines but mother nature delivers everything differently every year and if your your wine is going to taste different every vintage it should taste different every vintage you shouldn't say well the alpha mega cabernet is is not the same as it was last vintage well that's because mother nature is different every year so we just go with uh, mother earth and uh, the winemakers say well this is what you've given me this year and Henrik said well I've got this. Uh, what you know, some people are, have routine jobs. You know, we just <laughs> the same day to day to day to day. And Mother Nature just delivers you something different every single day. Yeah, that's something you have to uh, to be able to adjust to. So I always said, um, the the day that you think you're in charge of uh, of winemaking, and uh, on top of that, um, you you need to take yourself off that pedestal because. You're working with um, a product, just like any farmer out there or any agricultural business, you're under the mercy of, uh, of Mother Nature. So weathers uh, can change uh, so quickly and so rapidly. Um, but uh, with experience, I think uh, for winemakers, there, there comes a, a point where you can counteract uh, and, and try and, and then take some measures into hand uh, that will save a vintage from uh, from really uh, uh, Mother Nature throwing you a curveball. However, with the last couple of vintages in Napa, I mean, we have been blessed literally 18, 19, uh, they're, they're stunning vintages. 20, um, hopefully so as well, 2020 and, uh, and White's uh, early predictions, probably one of the best vintages coming out of Napa. So. Um, it's always about being humble enough to, to realize that you are not in charge, but, uh, but adapt to the conditions that you're given. Well said. You know, Henrik, and I, I think a lot about uh, great vintages in terms of, of what really happened. And I think for, for great vintages, I think it's those 
lack of drama vintages, like you said, the, the dramatic vintages, really what a grapevine wants to do every day is wake up and do its photosynthesis and grow some leaves and basically ripen its fruit because it's hoping that someday a bird comes along and eats its fruit and it's reborn somewhere else. But really the, the idea of having warm days and cool nights, which we naturally have here is that natural on off switch. But I think those temperate years where there isn't any drama, these grapes glide to maturity. And when they glide to maturity, like they don't get rushed to maturity, they get a chance to develop complexity because they're not being rushed. And if you think about your adolescence, for example, as a child, something you probably don't think fondly of, and yet it was an important part of growing up. That to me is what's important with grapes. They need to go through all those phases and a, and a moderate year like that allows them to develop those complexities that perhaps other years they get rushed to maturity and, and miss out on those. And I think that's really, when you look at the, the climate cha challenges that we're having these days, I'm not sure that we'll have vintages like 18 that often. No, and it, it's actually a fascinating point, Bob. I, I think you, you're touching on something that is important for winemakers as well. So if uh, grape growing was just a matter of getting enough sugar into the grapes before you harvest them, bring them up to a certain level and then uh, decide on the pick date from then, you probably have greenhouses where you could uh, grow vines. I still haven't heard of that, but um, with, with other uh, crops out there, it's, it's a matter of just uh, reaching a certain level of ripeness. However, with grape growing, it's different because we're looking at um, getting certain flavors into uh, to the grapes, certain uh, um, uh, uh, things that can uh, emphasize the, the beauty of, of that growing season. And that doesn't necessarily come with, uh, with high sugars or, or with sunshine every day. We actually have examples uh, here at Alpha Omega. Uh, we go out and we, we kind of uh, counterbalance sometimes a growing season. So we have some netting that we can uh, put up in front of the cluster zones out in the vineyards. And that actually is to protect the grapes from direct sunlight. So we want filtered sunlight. Uh, and you can say that we are, we're slowly uh, adjusting mother nature but that's one of the, the small tricks that we have up our sleeves as, uh, as winemakers. And I think, again, if you have a, a balanced season um, and we get into this term called phenolic ripeness, that is key to really making a balanced wine. Because if you have a sugar balance that, that shoots out of control, uh, imagine a heat spill, uh, like I mentioned in 2017, that is gonna bring your sugar uh, way, way out and out of balance from the rest of the maturity of the berries. Um, what sugar does to wine, needless to say, during uh, the alcoholic fermentation, yeast is transformed into alcohol. So technically you, in a, in a very, very sunny vintage, you can imagine a wine that was actually 20% alcohol, but didn't have the, the structure or, or the dimension of a, of a good vintage. And I think that's exactly what we see with the 2018 Everything is balanced to the T, not too much of one thing, not, too, too, uh, uh, not enough of another thing. It's just a, a wine that is in perfect balance. And I think that, that was the gift that the winemakers received in 18. Delicious. There's balance in all these wines. Uh, they're absolutely incredible. This, this has been a, a delicious flight mm. of three of our wines here today. Uh, Bob Bath, Henrik Polson, thank you for uh, analyzing those with us. We got to go back in time. We got to go back and announce some winners here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got trivia winners. First off, our second trivia question on uh, relatively simple, but uh, some people some people got it wrong. It's kind of tricky. Uh, why, why do we celebrate St. Patrick's Day on the seventeenth? Well, now we need to figure out why does Alpha Omega celebrate on the thirteenth? But <laughs> why? no, because no, 17th. You can't drink during the work week. We're telecommuting. <laughs> we're working. The seventeenth is in the middle of the week. Exactly. <laughs> the death of St. Patrick. The death of St. Patrick. Uh, I, absolutely. Some people had the, the the year when he was born. The day he was born. So uh, tricky. But our winner for the uh, second trivia question, Christina Devon. Christina oh, Devon. Christina. Which I gotta say, Christina <laughs> joins us in a lot of our virtual tastings. Uh. We love her. She's quick on the draw and she's always dressed up, always preparing for the theme. And she's just, she might double up. She, you know, she, actually, we're, we're going to get into our best attire in a second here, but 
Christina's of Irish descent, and oh. she cooked corned beef and cabbage today. Woo, well, that's, I love corned beef. That's American. And cabbage. It, well, now we know that. Yeah, <laughs> we know we should be wearing blue. Oh. Not, we should be wearing blue and not green. Oh, she's, we've got a we've got a picture of them. Oh, look at their view. Yeah, so she's oh. celebrating uh, over here. She's got blue pants on. Okay, that counts. Oh wow! That oh, works. Wow. How about her shoes? What are the? Yeah, what color are your shoes, Christina? Uh, <laughs> Congratulations, Christina. That's a magnum of 2018 uh, Oakville Cabernet Sauvignon. I think this has been a year you know, of stocking her cellar. Yeah. She's stocking up Christina, her cellar. Christina, we're stocking up your cellar. You you're, know, you're amazing. We we got to start some uh, trivia uh, records. Time how fast? Because they're so Jeopardy. fast. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay, we're gonna have a, it's a matter of seconds with some of these people. I think before we finish the question, the answer was already in. There. I know. It, <laughs> Christina, that's a magnum. I try to stall a little bit. Yeah, it, draw it out a little yeah, bit. Draw, we need to work on our trivia. We <laughs> throw know. two parters out at them and they get them instantly. The two parters. Yeah. I don't remember that. You guys, you uh, guys. I hope you're not Googling out there. We hope you're not Googlers no, out we're there. We're not going to let them Google. We're not going to let them Google. We'll figure that out. But uh, that's a magnum of uh, 2018 Oakville. Uh, our brand new single, AVA Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, in a collaboration with Andy Erickson, our consulting winemaker. Ugh, hasn't even it, been released yet. Goes it out should be nice to taste it. that someday. It, I would love to taste <laughs> yeah, that. Christina's going to taste Michelle that. Would like to taste that it. wine actually might not even make it to release. That might that wine could be sold out completely pre-release. Congratulations, Christina. Now, we got to go best attire. This was tough. This was very tough. It, it pains us to have to announce one winner on this because we had a few, uh, uh, several notable entries that all deserve to win. One, the Bartmas clan. Incredible Woo! setup on the Bartmas clan. I see a lot of green on the Bartmas clan. And, and, and selfishly, I am related to the Bartmas clan. Oh, Aunt, conflict. uncle, cousins, conflict. the Bartmases. So I'm going to raise a glass to the Bartmases. Cheers to you. Unfortunately, <laughs> they didn't win. Uh, but th this was attire and decor, a combination. Um, uh, it looks like I'm going to be sending the Bartmases some wine. Uh, Christina well, we, Devon. We also. can have a tie. We can have, well, we've got one. We've got one oh, winner right now. Uh, Robin's, Robin just wants to keep giving out magnums here. Uh, <laughs> that, that's why you're the best, Robin. But Christina Devon also had an amazing setup, as you just saw. But our best attire and decor winner for our virtual tasting today, Stephen Schaefer. Stephen Schaefer. Oh. Let's cut the Stephen Schaefer <laughs> setup. Oh, look at him. Look at him. They're all green. We've got masks. We've got, oh, this is. Hey, Steven and crew, congratulations cheers. to you guys. Uh, cheers. Right on. Cheers to them. Oh, they look great. Oh, that's a sweet setup there. They got a large format of one, an alpha. They got a three liter of alpha mega as a display. Wow. They know how Michelle likes to set things up Yay. here. Love it. Well, they need to replace that display. They need to replace that with a fill. That. I they hope that thing's do. full. Well, the next and they need another one on the display. other side to balance it up. <laughs> we'll help you with that, Steven. But congratulations uh, to all of our trivia winners. Hey, keep coming to our virtual tastings. We're going to keep doing trivia, keep doing best attire and decor. Uh, and we're, it, we're always giving away big old bottles of really good wine. <laughs> well, we always have the greatest experiences. We have um, wonderful chefs from the CIA. Uh, Lars, Lars, thank you. A founder, yeah. founder of the CIA um, School, Culinary School. Amazing to be in your presence. We feel so honored to have you here with us. Oh, and Father Amen, Donald, brother. Father, Father what, was uh, it pretty Donald good? Burke. Was the food good? I've been it's all drinking, good. I've been <laughs> eating <laughs> and drinking for the last hour You're while you have share. been talking. I'm very happy right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Long history, uh, Rancho Visadori, uh, Robin's on that trail ride too. And Ronald Reagan was in uh, my husband's camp and Father Donald, has been blessing the ride for many years, a wonderful Franciscan. And then, you know, just our staff that's here with us, is just uh, uh, that you don't see that's back of the house. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Honore, to Vicki, yeah. to Kelly Carter, yeah. to Ryan, uh, to that whole them. team that, that's doing all this production. And I mean, Bob and Henrik to listen to you guys talk. And I didn't have to pay to go to the CIA. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. So you guys are getting free education here. Um, and Barrett, you're you're the best virtual embarrassment. Did I say embarrassment? Virtual embarrassment. <laughs> no, hey, 
That 18 <laughs> was it. really good. She had a good effect. I'm never going to forget that. That was gold. <laughs> well, that was gold. We, we, we've, just, we've just been moving um, <laughs> from one house to the other. And we just we just rolled right in today uh, really fast. But I'm so grateful for everybody. I'm grateful for our family. Our Alpha Omega family is so strong and so beautiful. And your participation is so much fun. And we're going to keep doing these. Just uh, keep in touch with, with our schedule. You should have them in your wine club shipments. You should have them in your shipments. We have an insert that goes out with every wine shipment now that has a schedule of virtual events. And so please come participate. Uh, you know, Luau Milan, one of the top 10 virtual tastings in the United States last year, written up in a publication. That's gonna happen again this year. So we have a lot of great things happening. We have a great team here. Um, we all came together in March and said, you know, we're all gonna pivot and learn how to do new things. and. We're not hiring an outside big film production team. We have homegrown Napa group here and we're all doing this together. And, um, and it's a blessing in our, in our Zoom um, manager, director, Zoom God is one of Napa's homegrown who has been in Chile since last year. He, he married a wonderful woman and they're trying to get back home. Um, home is there for him, but his, I know he misses his grandmother. Corey, thank you so much. God bless you. You're an amazing person. He's running everything. He's, he's flipping the cameras left and right. And we are a family. And um, I feel so blessed to be around all of you and amongst all of you. And um, here's to St. Patrick. Yeah, yeah man. Here's yeah. to you. Slante. Real, real quick Slante. before we go, though. Slante. I, I just want everybody to know that we've got a really incredible offer on these wines, a reorder package that we're going to be emailing oh, them. Okay. I don't want to say this in front of you, Robin, because you're probably oh, no, gonna, no, you're no, not no, going to no. like the price that he, we're going to give these wines like to them the for, D but word. we're no, going to email you all prices. a reorder uh, package, uh, an exclusive offer on uh, a six pack order of the wines that we enjoyed today. Again, the 18 Drew, the 17 Cabernet Sauvignon, those are almost out, uh, incredible wines. And I mean, these, these 18s, these are ones that you're going to want to stock up on. So we're going to follow up with an email. We'll have some of our brand ambassadors reach out to you, stock up on some of these wines. Uh, and, and then it, again, it was a pleasure having you all. I want to go back to Michelle and Robin uh, for the final cheers and the close. Well, you know, I'd like to give it to Father Donald to, um, to share the wonderful cheers that he did um, earlier. Um, a wonderful Irish, unless you have a limerick, but I love your toast. If you would please share it with us. I submit to you all today that over two, about 2,000 years ago, the good Lord Jesus himself, his first miracle, they call it a miracle, he turned water into wine. I can tell you, Henry, he didn't even know about you at the time, but you would have been signed on instantaneously. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Henry. To every one of you, I say to you, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your backs. Until we meet again, may God hold all of you in the palm of his hands. Slante! Slante! Slante. Slante.